The title of my message today is Comforter, Helper, and Guide. So over the last couple weeks, the last two weeks specifically, we've been going through the Trinity, right? We've talked about God the Father and who God the Father is for us, right? How do we see him, right? And last week, we went through the second person of the Trinity, which is Jesus, who, who is the person who died for our sins, our Lord and Savior. The one without him, we wouldn't be here today. We would not be in communion. We wouldn't have relationship with each other today without Christ and what he did on the cross. We walked through everything that he said about himself and how that left us with three different options, that he's either a liar, a lunatic, and he's either the best liar in the world, because he fooled all of us. He's either a lunatic and crazy, completely delusional, or the third option was he's exactly who he said he was, and that is God. That is the word of truth. That is God walking on this earth. So we've talked, about the God, we've talked about God the Father. We talked last week about God the Son. It's now we get to talk about God the Holy Spirit. Because our God, as Christians, we believe that our God is triune in nature. And triune just means three in one. We don't believe it's three separate gods. Let's lay the foundation. We don't believe that, God, that we serve three gods. We serve one God. But that God is three in one. He is a, there's three distinct persons in God nature. We have God the Father, God the Son, and today, like I said, you're going to be going through God the Holy Spirit. Because we can't have the Father without the Son. That's why we have to talk about it. And we can't have the Son without the Father. And we couldn't have either Son or Father without the Holy Spirit. Because that's just His nature. You can't remove one or the other and say we worship the same God. Because there's a lot of religions in this world that'll, that'll say, well, we worship God the Father and God the Son, but we just believe the Holy Spirit to just be not really fully God, not the same, doesn't have the same nature, doesn't have the same power, doesn't have the same characteristics, doesn't have the same holy nature as God the Father. Or they believe in God the Father and God the Spirit, but they don't believe that Jesus is who he said he is, that he is God, that they just believe he's a small g God. So you can't remove one of them without changing the whole definition of God. So I'm going to open up in prayer. Lord, thank you once again for today. Thank you that we can walk through your scriptures, Lord. That we can take a look at who you are in our lives. So I just pray right now that what we go through today, what we talk about today, just aren't, they're not my words, Lord, but they're your words spoken through me. And that one person can just better understand the work of your spirit in their lives. So we just thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Three of you. Everybody said, there we go. Amen is just we stand together. That's what that means. That we're, we're saying amen and we're agreeing. We're all in agreeance together. So when we say let's say amen, it's because we want to, we, we're just in agreeance together. So last week when I talked about who Jesus is, I began with who he's not. Right? Because we have to be able to differentiate who the world said he was and who he said he is. And we start that by going through who Jesus is not. And so we're going to do the same thing today. We're going to go through and start with who the Holy Spirit is not. You know, a lot of mystic religions, a lot of other religions, or other quote-unquote sects of Christianity that aren't biblically based, acknowledge the Holy Spirit. You know, you have secularism, and they acknowledge that there's a force, and they call it karma, Right? as well as you have Hinduism, that they acknowledge the same force and call it the same thing. You have a ton of different religions around the world that acknowledge one form or another of a spirit that is on this earth. And we know that because it's just our nature, because we have, that, we have a spirit living inside of us, each and every one of us. So who is the Holy Spirit, or who is he not? Well, He's not just, as other religions would describe it, some spiritual force that is floating and hovering around the earth. It's not some spiritual force. Now, he's also not 
a secondary prize that we get when we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. It's not, I accepted Jesus as, for the forgiveness of my sins. Oh, by the way, here's your carnival prize because you hit all the balls down at the carnival and it's the Holy Spirit and you can hold on to him and use him when you want in your pocket. He's not just a partner that's there for us when, we, when only we want him. The Holy Spirit is not an it. I want to be clear of that. The Holy Spirit is not an it. It's a he. It's a, it's, a, it's a real thing. He is a real thing. And I have to catch myself because I just said that. But he is a real thing. And we can go on and on and on and on and on and on about who the Holy Spirit is not. Right? We can, we can talk about how he's not, like, again, just some prize that we get. Or we could talk about how he's not less than the other two. He's not less than God the Father or God the Son. We can always go through a whole message about who he is not, but that's not what we're here for today. We didn't come to church today to hear who the Holy Spirit or learn who he is not. We came today so I can hopefully help with my limited capacity as a subpar speaker explain who the Holy Spirit is in our lives. And not just who he is, but the role he's supposed to play in our lives. And not just the role he's supposed to play, but at the end, what our actions, what our response, what we are supposed to do with this God, with our God. So when we first open the scriptures and we want to see who the Holy Spirit is, we can just turn to the first page in your Bible. Genesis chapter 1. That is the first time we see of the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1 verse 2, it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. It wasn't Jesus who was hovering over the face of the waters, even though he was there in the beginning as the Word. It wasn't the Father who was hovering over the waters. He was seated on his throne. It was the Spirit. It was God's Spirit hovering over the waters. It goes on to say, and then God separated the waters from, from the deep, and it goes through the creation account where he's speaking, and Jesus' word, the word of God is speaking, and then the Spirit is moving. So God the Father speaks, the word activates, and the Spirit creates. They work together. So the Holy Spirit, we can see, is in the very, 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 very beginning in verse 2. And it's backed up if we go back to the book of Job, which, if you know your Bibles, is actually written before Genesis. The account of Job is an older book than Genesis. And it says, by, in Job 26, verse 13, it says, By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. In other translations, he has created the heavens by his spirit. So all through the Old Testament, we can see the Holy Spirit wasn't just there. He was an active participant in the creation of our earth, in the creation of our universe, in the creation of the heavens, in the creation of the ground we walk in, in the creation story. He was an active participant. In fact, I would say the one who activated and created it all. So we can't just look at the Holy Spirit as some background third person less than in the Trinity. He's not. But he's an integral part of the creation of our earth. He is equal to the Father. He is equal to the Son. He's not a backseat driver. He's not a backbencher in this Trinitarian belief that we have of God. You know, we can also turn to Matthew 29, verse 19. And this is further evidence. This is Jesus telling us about the Holy Spirit's power. Because when we baptize people, Jesus gave us this commandment to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So even Jesus, as fully God in human form, recognized and agreed and proclaimed the power and Godhead of his Spirit. Because if Jesus is fully God, which he is, why would he tell, why would he tell his disciples and further down the line, us today, to be baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, oh, and some lesser thing. 
It would remove the power that the Father and the Son have if the Holy Spirit was just some lesser thing. So Jesus understood that. So we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is not some lesser thing. The Holy Spirit is also everywhere all the time. Because Jesus was in Judea and Israel. Jesus wasn't everywhere all the time. He was a singular person walking around in a ministry for three years. Now, God is omnipresent, but God is omnipresent through his spirit. It's the spirit of God that is everywhere. And that is how the, spirit, that is how the Holy Spirit is allowed and able to be everywhere. You know, David, King David writes in Psalms 139, verse 7 to 8, and he's talking about God. He gives God the credit, but he also, even in the Old Testament, understands and recognizes the spirit and the power that the spirit has. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. King David is, is writing in this, in this psalm, in this song that he wrote, saying, Lord, no matter where I am, your spirit dwells there. I cannot escape who you are because you are everywhere. It doesn't matter how far I run, how much I want to leave, how much my sins burden me and I want to turn my back from you and hide from you, I can't because you were there. Now that's a whole message in itself. We can do weeks on that just alone. But that's, once again, the Holy Spirit. That is who the third person of this Godhead is. is he is always there with us. He is actively with us every day. And that brings us to another attribute of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is active. Once again, he's active in creation. He was active in the Old Testament. He was active daily. He was active with the apostles and the disciples. And he is active today. Like you say, he's not just some background force floating around the earth. He's an active participant in our lives. You know, just as Jesus taught his disciples that while he was here on earth, the Holy Spirit came into this earth after Jesus ascended to heaven so he could be actively teaching us. And we know that because Jesus, before he left, in John 14, verse 26, he gave his disciples this promise. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So the Holy Spirit, the promise that Jesus gave his disciples that while he was leaving and no longer going to be on this earth to teach them and guide them and show them the ways of the kingdom, that when he leaves, his spirit will then come and will guide them and teach them and continue to teach them. And we see that and we celebrate that after Easter. We call that Pentecost. It's where the disciples, the 120 of them, were up in the room praying, waiting for God to come back, waiting, thinking Jesus was going to return, and the Holy Spirit came down on them, teaching them instantly, giving them a word, so that when Peter stood out of the window, he was able to preach a message about repentance in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, and 3,000 people that day in Israel got saved. That is how the church grew, was through the inclusion of the Holy Spirit in our lives. So the Holy Spirit guided the authors to write the scriptures. They didn't do it on their own. And the Holy Spirit, helped uh, with guiding of the authors, helped clarify key Christian doctrines that we hold on to today that we would not be able to understand without his Spirit in our lives. Hence why when you talk to people on the street sometimes and you talk to them about regeneration or dying to yourself or loving others, when they don't deserve to be loved, those are uniquely Christian doctrines that people just can't grasp and people can't understand because 
they don't have the spirit living in them. Like they can get the surface level of I'm going to be nice to other people. They get the surface le- the, the surface level of well, of course I'm not going to do bad to somebody else. But that underneath they they don't get it's because they're image bearers of God. As Christians, we understand that we don't do bad to other people. We don't hurt other people. We don't murder, murder other people. We don't treat other people poorly, not because they're just another person and we want to feel good about ourselves, but because they're image bearers of God. That they've been created in God's image. But we get that revelation and we get that understanding in our heart, not from our own minds, but because God, The Holy Spirit reveals that when we study God's Word. Because there's no other culture, there's no other religion, there's no other faith truthfully in this world that can stand on a firm foundation and proclaim that with absolute authority besides Christianity. Now the Holy Spirit, not only is He active in our lives, but He also helps us and He guides us. In John 14, verse 16, Jesus tells his disciples once again, and I will send the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. So in, in, in John, if you want to learn more about the Holy Spirit, go John 14, 15, 16, 17. It's an amazing amount of scripture where Jesus is promising this helper, promising the Spirit to come to his disciples. But we can see in the span of verse 16, in John chapter 14, verse 16, and John chapter 14 to 26, we can see within 10, chap- 10 verses, Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit gives him two to three different distinct names. Right? Verses, and he will teach, calling him a teacher, and then calling him a helper. And he calling him forever, saying he'll be with you forever, giving him the, the title of everlasting. So when we get this helper who is active in our lives, who helps, helps us and who guides us, it's forever. Once we become saved, we accept the finished work on the cross, the Holy Spirit comes into our hearts and changes our lives, and he's with us forever. Once again, he's not just some background participant. He is active in our lives. And we need this in our lives. Like, truthfully, you and I are not good people. We can pretend to be good. We can say we're good. We can live our lives 75% of the time as good people. But when rubber meets the road, we're going to be selfish. We're going to be self-indulging. We're going to be cruel. Because that's the nature. That is our sin nature in Adam. So we need this help because if we're told to love Jesus and Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, we can't keep his commandments on our own. We can't just do it. It is impossible for us by our own will, our own fortitude, our own backbone to live this life and keep Jesus' commandments by ourselves. So that's where the Holy Spirit comes in and helps us to keep his commandments. And then he guides us in it. And he convicts the world of their sin in it. And he convicts us of our sins in it. That's why we read in John 16, verse 8, and he said, this is again Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit to his disciples, and he said, and he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And when the Holy Spirit comes to this earth after Jesus ascends into heaven, he convicts the world of sin. He shows us our true nature on a daily basis. Not to show us that we're bad, but to show us the fact that we are in need of the work, that Jesus, the finished work of the cross. That is the job, one of the jobs of the Holy Spirit. It points us back to our need daily for Jesus. Now there's a ton more attributes. There's a ton of more things that we could go through about the Holy Spirit. And truthfully, we could spend a year. I know we just finished almost a year in the the book of Ephesians, but if we spent and we picked out every attribute of the Holy Spirit, we could spend a year on this stage going one by one by one, over 52 weeks, about who is the Holy Spirit. We may do that in the future, but 
I get the ability to hopefully give a 30,000 foot overview. And since we only have 30 to 40 minutes today, when we look at who he is and who he's not, we have to look at why he's here, why he was sent. And what is his role in our lives as Christians? You know, there's many ways that the Holy Spirit works in our lives. But the one thing, and I said this earlier, the one thing that they all have in common, every way that the Holy Spirit works, the one thing that keeps it in common is he points us to Jesus. He points us back to Christ. And he does that so we can become on a daily basis basis more Christ-like in our lives. His, his, his goal is to keep us in relationship with God and point us back to Jesus and make us more Christ-like. So how does he do that? How does he make us more like Christ? Well, one of the ways, and I'm going to, I should have warned you at the start, we're going to spend a lot of time in those five chapters of John. So one of the main ways the Holy Spirit keeps us and points us and helps us make us more like Christ, is he guides us in all things that are true. In John 16, verse 13, Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit. When the Spirit of truth comes, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but will tell you what, is, what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. So the Holy Spirit, when he comes to us, he won't guide us into lies. He won't guide us into darkness. He won't guide us into trouble. But he guides us into truth. And what we can learn from what Jesus is saying also in this is that when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, he guides us in the directions that we need to go. He will not leave us confused or broken, but he reveals the truth to us. And because he reveals the truth, and he is the truth, we can trust him on where he is leading and guiding us. We can trust him to act on behalf of, his, of our father like a father guides their kids. Because he is fully God in, while he, in his leading us. He is fully God in revealing truth to us because he is truth. So he can't lie. And when, while he leads us, he leads us like, the, like his children. He leads us like, our, like we're his sons and daughters. Now, we see this in Romans. In Romans, Paul's writing to the Roman church in chapter 8, verse 14 to 16. He says, For all who are led by the Spirit are like children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful of slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. So when we get the Holy Spirit, we are now led as children of God. Not as slaves that are meant to follow a rule book or pay back a, a, a debt that is owed or indentured servants, but we are children of the Most High, children of the Creator of everything. And we are led that way by His Spirit in our lives. Another way that the Holy Spirit makes us more Christ-like and I said, talked about this one earlier too, is he convicts us of our sins. Now, when we say conviction of sin, we need to make sure we are completely understanding this. There is a big difference of conviction and condemnation. There's a massive difference in our lives when we are convicted of our sins or condemned. The Holy Spirit will never condemn you for your sin but he will convict. He'll convict us in the middle of sinning. He'll, he'll, he'll put conviction on our heart after we have sinned, and he'll put conviction on our heart when we are just tempted before we've even sinned. Now, temptation's not a sin, but if we follow through, that's why he convicts us even before. And when we have the Holy Spirit being active in our lives, once again, he doesn't condemn us. He convicts us and he guides us in the truth, guides us in the word, guides us in God's glory to say like, no, my son, my daughter, you don't have to live this way anymore. That's the conviction. Because he knows just how quickly we will fall short of the standard that is set before us daily. 
and being honest here, and we all should be, we all sin. We all fall short. We all do not live the perfect life that God has called us to live, but it's because of the Holy Spirit being able to guide us and lead us and convict us and show us where we've struggled, show us where we've fallen short, that we can see the patterns and we can change them in our lives because of his conviction. Now, I read a quote. I don't know who said it, so I don't, don't attribute this to me, but when I was reading and studying for this, I read this quote, and it, and it stuck to me. It said, conviction of sin is our friend. The convictions of, for our sins are, is our friend. If we stop feeling conviction for our sin, that's when we have bigger problems. The reason we would have bigger problems is because if we, can stop, if we stop feeling convicted over our sin, it means we, we're, we're continually drawing ourselves away from God. We remove ourselves from his presence. We, re, we, we make that active decision, that active choice to say, I don't need you. I can do this on my own. And he'll honor our choice. You know, the Bible says he will never leave us or forsake us, which is true. God will, when you accept Jesus in your heart, Jesus into your life as Lord and Savior, he won't leave you. He won't forsake you. But he will let you walk on your own. He'll be with you. But he won't stop you from making the decisions you're making. So if we stop feeling that conviction of sin in our lives, we need to take inventory of ourselves. In John 16, verse 8, once again, Jesus talking about the Holy Spirit says, And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So the Holy Spirit's actively participating in our lives, again, making us more Christ-like by convicting of us of our sins, showing us where we fall short, and pointing us back to the cross. Because the conviction comes with forgiveness at the foot of the cross. Now, once again, another way that the Holy Spirit makes us more Christ-like is he reveals God's word to us. Because if we don't have an understanding of the word of God, if we don't under, have an understanding of who Jesus is, if we don't have an understanding of what it means to live an active Christian life, if we don't have an understanding of what God has already shown us through his word, we're going to pick and choose and put our own interpretations, our own meanings, our own standards behind those things, which are completely and possibly not what Jesus, what God had intended to be drawn from. Because not only does he reveal the word to us, but he's the one who created the word. He's the one who inspired the disciples, inspired the authors, inspired the prophets to write these books down. Now, when we look at the Bible in itself, right? a, a lot of things you'll hear, well, it's not trustworthy. It's been changed. It's been altered. There's been take, stuff taken out. Well, at the end of the Bible, it says, it gives us a promise about what would happen to that. But let me ask you this. I'm young. I like to think I have a good memory. Who remembers a conversation they had with a coworker three days ago? Anybody? You should raise your hand. I, I do. Right? If you remember a conversation with a coworker from three days ago. What about a week ago? What about a month? What about a year? What about 25 years ago? Do you remember the words that a coworker spoke to you in passing? The reason I say that is the book of Mark was written in 50 AD, 50, 60 AD. And the book of Mark quotes Jesus, right? So does the book of John. So does the book of Luke. So does the book of Acts. So does the book of Revelation. And the, the, the epistles that we read in Romans... Colossians, Ephesians, Jude, Jesus' brother, James, Jesus' brother, quotes Jesus. But those are all written 20, 30 years after Christ died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. Now, if we might have without, and, and if we might have a problem when we can record things from a conversation that happened a month ago and remembering it perfectly, 
how do we trust the word of God? Well, because it only can happen for how accurate it is through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So not only, once again, can we rely on the Holy Spirit to show us and guide us, but we can fully rely on what he teaches us through it because he is the one who inspired the authors to write it. Because when we have multiple authors over thousands of years, it's only by the work of God and through his Spirit that we can know it's true. So since he is the author of all things, the creator of all things, the Holy Spirit is the one who reveals all things to us. He is the standard of truth. He reveals the truth to us and brings to light when we read and study his word passages that we may have read years ago and forgot, and he plants those passages into our minds in different situations. So he helps us become more Christ-like by revealing the truth of the scriptures to us. Because the Bible is completely trustworthy, but it is impossible for us as humans on our own ability to understand without the work and without the help of the Holy Spirit. Now we can rely on the Bible and we can use the Bible for study. And Paul tells this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, All Scripture is inspired by God. He's meaning all Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit, given to us by the Holy Spirit. And it is useful to teach what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do right. And the way it corrects us is through conviction. The way it teaches us is through understanding. And the, all of that process is done through the power of the Holy Spirit. By revealing it to us. So that's how the Holy Spirit works in our lives. That's how the Holy Spirit, in, in, in a 30,000 foot view, when we have Him as a, and recognize Him as an equal partner in the Trinity, that's how He helps work in our lives, draw us and make us closer to Christ. Because He takes an active participant role in our day-to-day -day lives. So, with the, with the Holy Spirit doing that and being active and participating daily, what's our role? Because we do have some responsibility in this Christian life. We can't just hide ourselves and tuck ourselves away into a hole and say, you know, Holy Spirit, I'll just study my Bible. I won't go out. I won't live a life. But, so what is our role with the Holy Spirit? What is our role and responsibility? Well, simply put, our role, our responsibility, is to respond. Because the Holy Spirit is active in our lives, and if he's directing us and guiding us and giving us instructions and revealing us stuff to us and convicting us of our sins and drawing us closer to Christ and showing us that we need Jesus daily, that we have to repent for our sins, if he is showing us all of these things on a daily basis and we don't do anything, we're essentially laughing in the face of this amazing thing that God has done for us. So our role, simply put, is just to respond. It's to take action on the instructions that we are given. It's to listen to the conviction that he gives us for our sins. To acknowledge it and say, you know, I, I acknowledge this and turn away from it. And when we sin and do it again, it's to, it's to go back and say, I need forgiveness. It's to acknowledge the conviction of our sin. It's to turn away from our sin. Our actions, we need to turn away from how we live in the past. We need to be actively changing our lives. Because we're sinners. We're not perfect people. God knows that, and that's why he gives us the Holy Spirit to be a participant in our lives. So that he can direct us and point us in the right path. It's to take action by studying the word of God. Not just having a dusty Bible sit on your mantle and say, I'm a Christian, but you haven't opened the book. The only scriptures you memorized or the only scriptures you know were from when you went to summer camp for that one summer. 
or from youth group years ago, or from something that Pastor Paul or myself or my dad may have said on the stage that clicked because it touched your heart, and you're like, I like that one. You wrote it down one time, or you highlighted it in your Bible, but you've never opened the book to study the rest of Scripture. Our role is to respond to the Holy Spirit's drawing of us, ourselves unto him by studying his word. You know, my wife, she's a physiotherapist assistant at the Cross Cancer Institute um, on a casual basis because she raises our daughter and uh, our future kid. But she didn't get to that position. She didn't get to that educational level. She didn't get to graduate university by never opening up her textbooks. By never studying, by never understanding the, the tissues and the muscles that you have in a body, she had to actively work at that to become better. So the Holy Spirit reveals the truth to us, but he can't reveal the truth to us if we don't open the book. If we don't read it. You'll never understand what, wrote, what Paul is saying in the book of Romans if, you've never, if you don't read Romans. You'll never understand when Paul says in Romans chapter 1 that they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and live ungodly and God gave them over to their fleshly desire. You won't understand what that means if you haven't read it. Because we can preach and we can give you verses on verses on verses that back up our statements, that back up the scripture and the verse and the chapter and the sermon. But don't just take my word for it that this is what it means. Don't take Pastor Paul's word for it that this is what it means. Study the scripture yourselves and the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you yourself. So we have to take action. Because he'll when you take that action, when you take that small step of faith and say, you know, I don't understand this book. I don't understand portions of it. I don't understand the genealogies of it. But I'm going to trust that you're going to reveal it to me. And you take that small step of action, the Holy Spirit will open it up and open your eyes and allow you to understand and have a deeper understanding of his scriptures than you ever did before. So we've got to trust the whole, that the Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to us. I'm going to invite the worship team back up here. Because I'm going to close. But once again, yeah, I know the videos. I didn't forget about the videos. As long as they have them queued up, they do. But once again, our role and our responsibility is to allow the Holy Spirit to guide us every day. To be an active participant in our lives. To give him the power that he so rightfully deserves. Because he is the creator over all things. And he created us. He created this world we live in. So to give him the power to be part a participant in our lives. Daily. In the decisions we make, we need to have him involved. The jobs we take, we need to pray about. If you're unmarried, the person you're going to marry, you need to seek his wisdom in. The decisions we make, we need to make sure we are active with the Holy Spirit. Because he is God. We can't treat him as just the last person in the Trinity, a lesser than of God the Father and God the Son some spiritual force, or some magic wand that we can wave around and pray for healings. He's active and he is fully God. So we need to allow him to be an active partner in our lives. And once again, I said this is a 30,000 foot overview because I know some people in church when they say, hey, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Well, let's talk about praying in tongues. Let's talk about the gifts. Let's talk about the miracles. Let's talk about the activating the things that the Holy Spirit will do in our lives through us to heal the sick, to give us a new tongue. And that's all true. And he will do all those things. But we need to let him do those things. We need to be an active worker with him in those things. Not to show that we're good Christians, but because when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives, he takes action through us. 
And that's where the speaking in tongues comes from. That's where the prophesying comes from. That's where the healings come from. That's where the forgiveness comes from. That's where you're able to forgive somebody for something that they've done that was wretched against you that you never thought you could is through the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So if we don't allow him to be an active partner, an active participant in our lives, we're not allowing him to do the work he, want, he wants to do. And last thing is for us and our role and our responsibility is to allow the Holy Spirit to continually transform us daily. Because his goal, his role is to point us to Jesus, to point us to the fact that we need him. So we have to allow him to do so. We have to allow him to transform our lives. To show us the ways that we need to change. To transform our hearts and change our hearts from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh. So we can love deeper, we can forgive quicker. So once again, our, main, our role in this relationship with the Holy Spirit is to just allow him to do his work. When we allow the Holy Spirit to take an active role in our lives and point us back, point us to the finished work of Christ and how we need that, forgiving somebody is, not, is simple. Loving somebody we seem to think would be unlovable is simple. When we allow the Holy Spirit to do his job in our lives, our life, I truthfully, truly believe it, gets easier. The situations might get harder. Because you'll get attacked more from the devil. But getting through it will be simpler, will be easier, will be more fruitful in our lives. So if we can stand, I'm going to close in prayer. And we're going to worship. And I say this every week, the front of the church is open. The altar is open. If you've never actually accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today is the day. Come up for prayer. If you've never prayed for the Holy Spirit's power to overtake your life and help transform it, come up for prayer because that is a gift for you today. Or let's say you have, but you've drawn yourself further away from God or, or, or pushed back the Spirit's work and power in your life. Come up for prayer. Because he'll re-overtake your life and he'll engulf you with a power and a new passion for him that you've never felt before. Or if you just need prayer, if you're hurting, come up for prayer. These altars are open. It, it, we, we, we don't just say this just to check off a spiritual box at the church of saying we invited people up for an altar call. It's true. You can find forgiveness at the foot of the cross. Like I said, if you're here today and you don't know who Jesus is, you don't know who this Holy Spirit is, Jesus is God who walked this earth and lived a life that you and I could not live and died a death that you and I deserve because you and I are sinners and God is holy and perfect and righteous and no sin can be allowed into heaven. So he turned his back on his son on the cross and t put the weight of the world's sin on his shoulders and let him die. So that when he returned and resurrected on the third day, God now sees you and I when we put our faith and trust as him, not as the wretched sinners that we are, but as his son, perfect and blameless and righteous. And there's no other way for you to get this power of the Holy Spirit. There's no other way for you to get to heaven and have forgiveness for your sins than through Christ. So if you are here today and you don't know who Jesus is, I urge you today, make him Lord Seek his face, repent of your sins, and turn to him. So Lord, just, we just thank you for today. Thank you that once again we can worship you. Because that's all today's are for. That's all Sundays are for. The music, the message, the response, it's just worship to you for being good 
and being holy and being righteous and having mercy on us. So we just thank you that we can worship you. And I pray that, Lord, somebody's heart gets touched today. Somebody turns their face to you. Somebody accepts you, Lord, that you just work your miracles and change their lives today. We just thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.